I literally loved sort of getting a little pack and going, walking off into a national park or whatever. And it, I was never a tiger walker. I just like going to somewhere nice, like, you know, eight k's in from the nearest road, a, a little creek, a little pond or whatever, and just set up camp and just be in the bush. It's sort of like actually being in a place, getting the feel, the, the grit of it. Um, it's also just I enjoy it, you know. I really enjoy, you know, two or three day walks through the Butterwangs or whatever, or just being in country. There is also something about, uh, you know, gouache paper that you know it's it's of all the things it's it's the most natural intuitive um fluid thing color paper and a, and a nice long brush you know It's fluid and it moves quickly, and yet it's got an opacity. I like the grittiness of gouache. At the same time, it's, it will flow quickly. I mean, gouache is basically pigment, and acacia gum, it's an African wattle, not an Australian wattle, but essentially that's gouache, right? And they both have this quality. They can be quite subdued, and yet they've got this sort of deep hum because of the pigment density. So you can get these sort of... Uh, visual colour hums are a bit like the sort of low register of a big pipe organ or a double bass or whatever. So they're, they're not shrill. At the same time, they're, they're not weak. They're, they've got a sort of hum de density to the feel that is right for the landscape. How I've come to work more and more... Um, is even with the quite large canvases, I, I have them flat on the floor. I, I just feel much more comfortable. And it's so somehow f is a different way of looking to things up on the wall. I still do stuff up on the wall, but so the gouaches have always done flat on the ground because it's a wet running medium. If you stick it on the wall, it just dribbles everywhere. And also walking around the bush, I'm not going to carry any easels or something, you know. With the bigger canvases, obviously, I have, by the stage I do them, gone through X amount of works on paper and drawings, and I, I have a fairly strong sense of an image movement that, before I start. So it, there's a sort of process, I, but I really don't like to think too much about that sort of thing because it sort of gets in the way. By the time I went to Bundan on the first time, so that's winter of 2001, yeah. I had a fairly clear idea about this walking thing, and I, I was actually just thinking about I'd, I'd go up from behind, from the residency up onto the ridge behind, and that's a quite bushy ridge. With, there's a bit of a track, but a lot of time it's pretty, you know, just wander. And I started to have this idea about trying to represent walking along that ridge, and I've been thinking about something like an analogy to fugue. And I just started thinking about, well, you know, when you walk along somewhere, then a lot of time, if you're following a bit of a track, it's sort of just tootling along, looking at trees, etc. Then every now and then you might sit down on a rock sh shelf and you can actually sort of boil a billy and see out. So it's just, it's a whole, the, the experience is this whole lot of discrete but connected things, you know. So I, that's where I first thought, of trying to do a fugue sort of thing, which is that painting, which is the first painting in the, you know, the oldest in the show, I think. And it itself sort of grew itself. I, I, I actually remember I painted the first three panels and realised, actually, I can, I can see more. And, and another odd thing about me, so I, I tend to basically work right to left. It's probably some just quirk of how the brain's wired or something, but um, I, I've always tended to work right left. I'm actually very 
fond of and I feel quite proud of Shoalhaven Bridge. I also see them as the paintings of a relatively young person. There, there's a degree of innocence and experience about this whole show, you know, to borrow from Blake, you know. In fact, I, I almost thought of using Innocence and Experience as a title for the show, except for it's already booked with a full dance card. When I first really started working on country, it was particularly places like around the fringes and edges of our more settled areas. Places like the settler country around Beaverville, Braidwood, etc. It, it's full of all these sort of places where people sort of set up and did something for a while and then went bust or whatever and there's just bits of tin and whatever and erosion trenches and it was really probably where I was starting to realise that it was really setting into me that landscape is actually a human artefact, that these are human stories. They're also deep time geological stories but they're stories, they're, they're, you know. And during that time, the Millennium Drought was starting to kick in and kick in. Things were getting pretty tough. And this little dam up on the ridge at Beaterville was dug just as things were getting pretty dry. And it, it never had more than about this much water. And after a while, it was just this sort of green scum and, you know, cattle hoofs and things like that. And I remember I did quite a few drawings of it. Um, and it just really hit me, you know, the, the, it, there's a visceral uh, thing about this quite place, this sort of hole, and that was all that's left of all our attempts to farm. And, you know, it, it was already like down the hill from the dam is that big gully that is the dryland gully, right? A big, enormous erosion trench, you know. Yeah, that, that one's probably about two k's long and then at its deepest would be about 10 meters full of dead cars from 1930 through 1950 you know, 60 attempts to stop it eroding you know but again it was a direct pretty direct confrontation with what i was seeing i've always realized that actually one of the things to look for is stuff that people have discarded rejected or whatever firstly in general the areas that uh, thinly populated by other artists uh, have a lot of potential, right? Yeah, you've room to move. Um, and secondly, that things that most people would neglect or pass over often actually can make really great subject matter. And that the damage, the um, scarred, whatever, actually, I, I, it's, it's easy to make poetry from that, the mundane. The hay plains, I mean, they basically started because we, we started going to South Australia, right? You've got this long run, really, from about Darlington Point to Hay and then through to Bell Ranald um, of this incredibly flat plain, you know. And, like, it's sort of, some would say, monotonous, but actually there's, there's a lot more variation in it than you, you first realise, and it does help if you've done it a few times because you, you start realising, you know, there's areas where the under, it, it, there's still remnant mallee type scrub and there's red scattered with salt bush and so on. There's areas of salt bush, there's areas that have been irrigated and planted to cotton or whatever. So there's actually a bit more change in the place. And in amongst the Hay Plains, there's also a few other ones that, um, I mean, same country, but again, like the west of Wilcannia, that sort of we were staying at a place on the Darling and went with the farm manager out to inspect fence lines and so on. So it's, again, slightly different country because you get, once you cross, leave the Murray Darling floodplains, you get into rockier country, you know. Um, and there's also one near the wonderfully named World's End Highway, which is sort of the edge of the Goiter line about 50, 60 k south of Barra, you know. Um, and they all actually have subtle differences. On a broader sense, I, I, I think some places just sort of like have a hum, they, they, they connect. Like the first time I went to, um, you know, the area of Vaduada, Oratunga, Northern Flinders, it just had this, and still does have this incredible hum. It, it really is holy land, you know. And that's where I first climbed the ridge behind the Oratunga homestead and saw Vaduada, which means the eagle spirit. That sweep sort of grew out of like uh, different senses, like, like 
Barra is a place of literally a lot, a lot of stone ruins and there's an enormous hole in the middle of the town that was this giant copper mine for about 20, 30 years. There's lots of ghosts in a way, a set of sort of ghosts. And then on the edge of Barra, there's this washaway gully that at places is actually serious about 20 metres deep and it's about probably four k's long that has a layer about uh, probably about five metres down from the top that is was the creek bed about 50,000 years ago. And then Oratunga, we started, we walked down Oratunga Creek towards Glass Gorge and there's lots of things like little petroglyphs. Um, you know, there, there was a rock overhang I remember spotting one day. I didn't go up to it, but you know, um, from the creek bed. Like, there's no track, but it's pretty easy country. Walking through these places, you, you couldn't help but feel the presence of stuff. And, and the place itself, like, it's got this hum. Um, when we got there, the, we have a recording of some very ancient Armenian hymns. And I just kept feeling this sort of, one of them in particular has this sense of like soaring eagle quality to it, you know. Also every now and then, they're, they're very rarely, but there are these sort of moments where it just feels, it, it's like, you know, what Yates said about the, like a long-legged fly upon the stream his mind moves on silence. So those sort of moments are best not to talk about because they might go away, but they, they sort of keep you going too.